This will be the final protein lecture for this chapter. So we're going to talk about protein quality. What is high quality protein versus a low quality protein? If it's high quality protein, technically it contains all the nine essential amino acids in amounts that support growth. It's a complete protein or a high quality protein. Most high quality proteins come from excuse me, animal um, sources or, or processed soy. Low quality protein lacks or has inadequate amounts of one or more of those nine essential amino acids. That's how they're classified. The most highly biologically available protein, believe it or not, is eggs. So that's great. They're relatively inexpensive, although prices have gone up. Um, but it is the most highly biologically available protein for digestion. I believe it's in the 95 to 97% range. So eggs are good for you. And uh, again, low, pro low quality uh, protein, most plant foods, again, except processed soy and gelatin. It's just kind of a table to show you some of the um, incomplete proteins, what the food sources would be, and what the li limiting amino acids are. In other words, what what are one of what which ones of the nine are missing? So you can take a look at that. It's actually table six nine in your book. And these are great foods. It's just that they don't provide a complete protein. So you can see how difficult it might be to be a vegan and how you really have to be mindful of what you're eating to make sure you're getting adequate nutrition, adequate protein. In terms of protein synthesis, we know after you eat, there's an anab anab anabolism that occurs. In other words, the creation of lean tissue. It's a growth period. And each cell uh, synthesizes protein in different ways, and it's um, influenced by a number of things. So you have increased plasma amino acids after you, we went over digestion protein, blood flow increases, there's hormonal release that enhances muscle protein acreation or synthesis. In terms of plant versus animal protein, um, I apologize, that is a repeat, but in general, um, we know, again, that the plant-based protein sources are limited to one or more essential amino acids, not as highly digestible as an animal source. And we do know that higher consumption of animal-based protein foods will result in greater lean uh, body mass accretion or growth. So if you're uh, resistant strength training, you are likely to make greater gains as a result of your training with higher quality protein or complete protein as long as you're consuming adequate carbohydrate as well. It's a myth that the more protein you consume, the more muscle you build. That's not true at all. The hormonal effects related to protein synthesis overnight when you fast because you're sleeping, it happens at a lower rate. Um, the degradation process is stimulated by two hormones, epinephrine, the fight or flight hormone, and cortisol, which is released from the adrenals. When there's a high glucagon to insulin, ratio, that's when you have the breakdown of protein. And again, I think I mentioned this before, but insulin is actually anabolic and promotes the synthesis of proteins. In foods, nearly all foods contain some protein. So for example, per serving, uh, most vegetables have two grams protein and most grains have at least two grams protein. But no natural food is 100% protein. So even a piece of meat is not 100% protein. So non-meat sources of protein I've listed for you. Again, uh, it's not that they're uh, bad foods or foods that you shouldn't be consumed. Obviously, they're all very good for you, um, but they're non-meat sources. Let's talk about changes in body mass with age. This is a little bit depressing. During adolescence, we typically see uh, greater, obviously, increase in boys than in girls as a result of puberty and testosterone and the androgens. They used to say this was after age 30, and now they've dropped it to 25, which is why now I say I'm 29 forever. After age 25, when you gain weight, it's fat, it's not lean tissue. This can be attenuated with weight training, resistance training. Do you, I don't know if you remember from history way back when, or at least for me in high school, uh, Ponce de Leon, the Spanish explorer, was running around Florida looking for the fountain of youth. I think strength training or resistance training is the fountain of youth. You can blunt this weight gain, uh, this adiposity, if you strength, if you uh, strength train, if you train with weights, weight resistance, and nothing crazy, you know, nothing Arnold Schwarzenegger-ish, but 
you can definitely blunt this process, slow it down, and even reverse it. And if you don't, your lean mass is going to de decrease as you get older. And uh, you have that sarcopenia or muscle wasting and a de decrease in total body water. So it's very important uh, in the elderly, in particular for balance, uh, to make sure that they maintain their muscle mass, which, again, is difficult. The process of aging uh, does pre present various barriers. So the recommended protein intake and amino acid intakes. The RDA for adults is 0.8 grams per kilogram. That's not a lot, so you don't need a lot of protein. The average American probably consumes 1.2 grams per kilogram. There's an adequate intake for birth to six months now and an RDA for the indispensable amino acids. There's still a lot of controversy, I'm sputtering, about whether or not how, how detrimental high protein intakes are. The, the extent or the degree to which a high protein intake has on your body. They fight about this all the time and it's, it's kind of come into the spotlight again. There's no upper limit. In terms of the amount of calories you could, should consume on a daily basis from protein, about 10 to 35% of your calories should come from protein. I think 35% is very high. That's my opinion. I, I'd, I'd aim more for the mid range. And I should mention that often as protein intake increases, it's it's somewhat self-limiting because you people tend to get pretty nauseous with increased, really extreme high protein intake. Just to give you kind of an idea of various categories of recommended protein intake, I already mentioned the RDA is 0 0.8, 0.8. If you're a recreational exerciser, it could go from anywhere to 0.8 up to 1.5. I think I just told you the average American takes 1.2. Bodybuilders have some higher needs. If, if someone has a pressure ulcer, so that's skin breakdown, and they're staged from one to four. Four is the worst. It's actually unstageable. And I would recommend as a dietitian in the 1.2 to 1.5 range, depending on how bad the wound was. The high protein, low carb diets are usually in the 1.6 gram per kilogram range. They get ketone bodies and they get nauseous and they get really bad fruity breath and a little bit spacey if you've ever worked with a colleague who's been on the diet. The estimated upper um, requirement for adults that we would use in the clinical setting, we never go higher than 2.0 grams per kilogram. We just don't. And I rarely, rarely uh, go above 1.5. If I was back in the ICU and we had multi-traumas, that might change, but at this time, I would, you know, I use about 1.5, but again, I never went higher than 2.0. Never say never, but I didn't. There's two classifications of protein deficiency and malnutrition. Quashia core is adequate energy with insufficient protein, and because of that uh, insufficient protein, there's changes in oncotic pressure, and you get tremendous edema. Uh, because of those decreased proteins basically in the blood. Marasmus is wasting or emaciation, and it is chronic insufficiency of both energy and protein. I'm not sure why that N is little. I'll fix that. So we don't really see these in this country. This is more of a third world country. You see those horrible, horrible pictures of those poor children in these countries starving, and it just breaks your heart. You know, commercials, they, they had more frequently on TV at one time. Th that's what you're seeing Quashio core and Erasmus uh, when you see those commercials. So how much does a 150 pound female need? And I just wanted to go over this example quickly because I think it drives home the point that we get a lot more protein than we think we do. So at about 14%, remember it was 10 to 35% is the range and I said I really wouldn't go as high as 35%. 14% of your calories coming from protein on a 2000 calorie diet would give you 68 grams of protein for a 150 pound female. So what does that look like? Well, three ounces of cooked meat, fish, poultry, whatever you want to eat, is a deck of cards. We all know that. And how much protein are we actually going to get in three ounces of cooked meat? Well, it varies a bit. Uh, there's 31 grams of protein in a chicken breast, 28 grams in a beef patty, 27 grams in sockeye salmon, and in tuna. 20 grams. Now these are exact measurements. Generally, as we say for one ounce of protein, 
it's seven grams. If I was going to do a quick calculation, these are actually uh, measured. So it doesn't take long. Uh, if we use my more general measurement, if you're going to eat an eight ounce steak at one of the steakhouses, I won't mention any names. So eight ounces times seven roughly is 56 grams of protein and you only need 68 in a day. So you can see why the average American consumes more protein than we actually need. We're a very rich nation, loosely speaking, versus a third world country, and we have access to these protein sources, which generally cost more. And that concludes the last protein lecture of, the ch of uh, chapter six. We'll see you again.